Okay, uh, I want to speak to you tonight on the subject, uh, question mark, good grief? <laughs> uh, somebody contacted me recently uh, and said, uh, why don't you preach a sermon on grief? I said, very interesting. I've been working on a series, but I'm not completed, I haven't completed the series. So that one sermon on grief is pretty hard when you realize almost everybody in the Bible experienced grief. So uh, it's quite a lot of opportunities uh, in the Bible. So I want you to turn to Psalm 31. Uh, David looked back on his life and he realized uh, some of the problems that he had been involved in where he had uh, disobeyed God. And when he disobeyed God, uh, he experienced grief. Um, and he says in Psalm uh, 31, um, <clears throat> he says, uh, beginning in verse 3, he says, For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, my truth. And uh, also in this uh, passage, he talks about the grief that he has experienced a little bit later in the psalm. So um, verses 9 and 10, notice what he says. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief, yea, my soul and my belly. For my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity and my bones are consumed. The greatest cause of grief, of course, is sin. But in this brief series, which was going to be a series, but I'm just doing one tonight, I want to show you the answer to the question, is grief good? And the answer is yes, it is. But I'm not preaching on this in order to make light of the pain that grief often brings into our life. There's nobody here tonight that haven't experienced some form of grief. Grief hits everyone at one time or another. People in God's word knew about the pain of grief and they even expressed themselves on it. I've had uh, hundreds of counselees who were struggling with grief. Some were grieving over the death of a spouse or the death of a child. Some were grieving over the loss of a parent. Some were grieving over wayward children, a son who was on drugs and had either died or been taken into prison or a pregnant teen daughter. And the grief has hit everybody. Uh, Dr. Charles Stanley in his book, The Source of My Strength, says this about the times of grief. Quoting now, the overwhelming feeling when one has grief is one of intense loneliness of being isolated from the rest of the world. Older people give frequent testimony to loneliness, especially after the death of a spouse. Grief becomes coupled with isolation and excruciating combination, end of his quotation. So lonely people are of all ages. Loneliness affects everybody, and uh, people like that live everywhere. Grief by itself is painful. We would agree with that. But coupled with loneliness or the sense of loneliness, it can be absolutely devastating. So let's be honest and admit a simple principle here. Grief is one of the realities of our human condition. You'll never be able to escape it. Grief is one of the realities of our human condition. But there is good news. You want the good news? <laughs> Not even grief is greater than the grace of God. So I want to give you an outline to hang our thinking on for the night. Number one, let's put down the definition of grief because it's often misunderstood. The online dictionary gives a world's definition of grief. He says, a deep mental anguish usually arising from bereavement, an annoyance, a frustration, a deep intense sorrow or distress caused by death or disappointment, a painful regret, sharp sense of sorrow over some affliction or loss, mental suffering, end of quotation. Most of you have known that you can go through the Bible and point to a lot of places where grief occurred. Esau caused grief to Isaac and Rebekah when he married a pagan wife. 
Genesis 26, 34 through 35. And when it says that they were grieved over his choice, he used a Hebrew word that meant bitterness, grief, and great trouble. Hannah, remember her? She was barren, could not have children. And in 1 Samuel chapter 1, she was praying that God would give her a child. And she said that she had grief over her condition. The Hebrew word there is a different word. It means vexation, anger, grief, sorrow, even something that provokes pain. Solomon in 2 Chronicles 6.29 expressed his grief over the nation's sins. He used a Hebrew word that meant anguish, grief, sorrow, and affliction. Job, of course, expressed grief over what God had allowed into his life. Job 6.2, he spoke of what had happened to him. He used the same word that Hannah used in her prayer, a word that means vexation, anger, grief, indignation, provocation, sorrow. David in Psalm 31 that we just looked at uses a totally different word, the word galon, means affliction, grief, or the deepest sorrow. So grief is like being whipped by your circumstances. Proverbs 17, 25 says this, uses the same Hebrew word that Job and Hannah used, says a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. And the word bitterness is added in there to intensify the word for grief. And it's a word that means intense bitterness. Parents can be grieved when their children make fools of themselves. The Apostle Paul was grieved when the church at Corinth did not deal correctly with sin in the camp. 2 Corinthians 2.4, he uses in that argument there, uh, to be that he was distressed, sad over what they had failed to do. He used the Greek word that means distressed, heavy with sorrow and grief. And then in verse 7, three verses later, he uses the word again and it's translated sorrow. Grief in one place, sorrow in the other, both tied together. Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 25, is encouraging the people to submit to God's authority even in the time of their grief. He says, to endure grief when you have suffered wrongfully. And he uses the same word that Paul used there. Hebrews 13, 17 uses a different word, says that people under the leadership of their pastors should uh, work with their pastors in such a way that when the pastor gives account to God for his ministry, he can do so with joy and not with grief. And the word there is a different Greek word, stenazo. It means to be in a narrow place, to be squeezed between two things that are putting pressure on you. And that focus is on the pressure caused by grief. I don't know about you, but whenever I've been in situations that were grievous, there were times that I felt like I was bound, you know, that I was straight jacketed emotionally by what was happening to me. Well, perhaps this, these definitions will give us a little bit of an understanding about the biblical concept of grief. So that's the definition. Let's look number two, put this down. I call this the direction of grief. If you are a grieving person, what possible direction will you be taking? Missionary Ron White, he and his wife and Jean and I went to school together at Tennessee Temple. They went off to Japan, and uh, when they got to Japan, my wife and I started supporting them and, uh, and, and outside of our church giving, outside of our tithes and our offerings. We were giving to the Ron White family while they were in Japan. And we still are giving to Ron, even though his wife passed away and he's now had a stroke and is in rehabilitation. We're still sending money to him for his ministry. But uh, his wife died young of cancer. And he said, he said this, my wife shared this with me, said that she remembered his saying this, that grief is a very selfish thing. Grief is a very selfish thing. What he meant was that the loss of his wife has caused too much focus upon how he felt. So let me give you some points under this direction of grief. First of all, 
the direction initially is inward, inward. Poor me, I'm suffering from loss. I'm at a loss as to what to do. I am so alone, I don't know what to do. And by the way, self-focus is never good spiritual eyesight. It's especially dangerous when it's caused by grief. And why is that? Because Satan delights to use our grieving time as one of his most effective wiles. And why does he choose to do that? Because in moments of grief, our level of vulnerability increases if we don't handle the grief scripturally. So first of all, the direction initially is inward. It's all about me, what's happened to me, how I'm feeling. Secondly, the direction thereafter is downward. Self-focus always leads us away from God, not to closeness with God. This appears to be why the Lord had his people in the Old Testament designate specific times for mourning and bereavement. Once that period of time was over, stop and move on. Uh, the days of mourning for my father are at hand, Genesis 27, 41. Joseph spoke of the death of Jacob, and he said when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph then moved on. Genesis 50, verse 10, he made a mourning for his father seven days. And Deuteronomy 34, 8, the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. So God said you can only weep and mourn for Moses a designated period of time. Some of the um, periods of time of mourning were approximately 30 days. Some were less. When I've been counseling people over the years, I often refer to what's called the downward spiral. And what happens is whenever a disappointment occurs in your life, which is what happens whenever you have a loss and you suffer grief, when a disappointment occurs, if you don't handle that correctly, you'll become discouraged. And if you don't handle the discouragement correctly, you'll become defeated. And if you don't handle that defeat correctly, you'll become depressed. And if you don't handle the depression, you'll go into despair. And if you don't handle the despair, you'll go to death. You'll commit suicide. And a lot of people that work on suicide lines, they recognize that downward trend. Matter of fact, at EMS, we had to learn a process called DABDA, where people facing a crisis in their lives or a grief in their lives went through similar stages leading to, uh, to a downward spiral. So it's a process, beginning with the improper management of our personal disappointments. I told somebody not too long ago, I said, what do you think the greatest gift is you can give your children? He said, I don't know. You don't leave them a bank account? I, no, no, no. Money won't do it. Well, what's the greatest thing? He said, uh, tell them about the Lord. I said, well, yeah, that's okay too. Let me, let me tell you what the best gift is that you can give your children. What's that? Teach them how to handle disappointments. If they can't handle disappointments, they become victims of the downward spiral. So anything that dis disappoints us can actually cause us to grieve if we don't handle the disappointment correctly. No personal loss or disappointment should ever weaken our relationship to the Lord. That should always be stronger than every grief that we face. So the more we focus on the grief of the moment than upon the grace of God, the more we focus on the grief of the moment that upon the grace of God, the farther down the spiral we go. Like Elijah, we may go so far down that we tell the Lord, it is better if you take my life. <laughs> then as he did with Elijah, God may have to confront our sinful attitude. I call this message, good grief, question <laughs> mark. So is there really anything good about things which cause us grief? Well, I want to give you some positive results if you handle grief scripturally. If you don't handle it scripturally, there are no positive results. Only if you handle it scripturally. So let's put down some of those there. I think there are four of them. Uh, number one, grief can remind us of our human limitations. Grief can remind us of our human limitations. And by the way, 
You know, we're so self-centered and so arrogant sometimes, we think we can actually uh, plan our lives better than God can. So what we need occasionally is a reminding that by ourselves alone, we may not be able to reverse what is causing us grief and pain. When we seek to dethrone God and enthrone ourselves on our heart's throne, what we're actually doing is challenging God's uh, sovereignty. When we seek to dethrone God and enthrone ourselves on our own heart's throne, we are challenging God's sovereignty. So how is it with you? I'm going to preparing this message. I was asking, how is it with you, guy? <laughs> Do you think you know better than God how your life should be? Do you think that what's causing you grief God should not have allowed? Job raised that question. I'm reading through the book of Job. He raised that question a couple of times, which proves that Job was not some superhero. He was actually like you and me. So do you think you know better than God how your life should be? If you do, God may have to give you something to grieve about to remind you who's really in control. There's another possible way that grief, I think, can be good. <clears throat> grief can remind us of the uncertainties of life. Have you ever noticed how our tendency is to just go on, everything's going so well and we're just having a great old time. We're not even worrying about anything uncertain, right? Mm -hmm. Until the uncertain thing raises its ugly head. <laughs> then, then we are attracted, right? Mm -hmm. So when circumstances do not follow our plan, frustration can set in. Robert, good to see you here tonight. Robert's always telling us this. He said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> <laughs> God says, look, I have a plan for you. We have plans, and the plans usually include our expectations, which is extremely dangerous. Job was wealthy. Think of that. He was the wealthiest man. He had a large family, and God says that he was the most righteous man there was. He had an honorable reputation. More important, his reputation was honorable with God. didn't make any difference whether it was honorable with his three friends or his four friends, right? But what happened? His grief was caused by the death of all of his children at once. A wind came out of the forest and struck the house and killed him. His grief was caused by the loss of all earthly assets. If you want to see st uh, uh, what they got, staccato affliction, read Job. This guy comes and he says, eh, the Sabaeans came and they took all your, your cattle while he was yet speaking, another man came and he said the Chaldeans came and they did. And pretty soon, you know, this man talked, this man talked, this man talked. Job hardly had a chance to take a breath between catastrophic events. I mean, they were just thrown at him one after another. Grief was caused by also an unsupportive wife. And then his grief was called when all of his friends said, the reason you're suffering this way is that God's judging you for sin and you better admit it. Then at the end of the book, we're fat, we find out they were wrong and Job was right. God may toss uncertainties into our lives to remind us of how certain he is. That's why Paul could write, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Remember in grievous times, David refocused on God as his rock, his fortress, his deliverer, his strength, his buckler, his high tower, and his salvation. Every one of those things is related to security. That's Psalm 18 too. So grief can remind us of the uncertainties of life. And, and I think we need to be fully aware every day we get up could be filled with uncertainties. I got up one day and got hit with three within six hours. Things I never expected. Well, let me give you a third good thing that can come out of grief if it's handled scripturally. Grief can remind us of something in our lives needing to be corrected. Grief can remind us of something in our lives needing to be corrected. You see, David was a teenager with a strong faith in God, and he took down the mighty giant warrior, Goliath, the Philistine powerhouse. Later, that same David became king 
a mighty warrior in his own right, slaying tens of thousands, but he was slain spiritually by his own lust for another man's wife. Then he tried to cover his sin. He said uh, to, to Joab, he said, I want you to put Uriah in the forefront of the battle. Maybe he'll be killed and I won't have to deal with this. <laughs> I mean, no matter how many circumstances you and I manipulate, God's still paying attention to what we're doing, right? Well, did this cause him grief? Well, let's let David tell us whether it called him grief. Listen to this. Psalm 6, 1, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger. 6, 2, my bones are vexed. 6, 3, my soul also is sore vexed. 6, 6, I am weary with my groaning. 6, 6, I water my couch with my tears. 6, 7, mine eyes are consumed because of my grief. So when Nathan confronted David about his sin, Nathan was dealing not with the grief, but with the cause of the grief. How he had sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah. David said, I have sinned against the Lord, 2 Samuel 12, 13. You know, pride and arrogance form the seedbed from which the seeds of grief can spring up. But there's another possible good that can come out of grief. Grief can remind us of the comforting power of God's grace. God was gracious to David in putting away the death penalty, 2 Samuel 12, 13. Nathan told him, he said, uh, you can relax because the death penalty for murder, there was a death penalty for murder, right? And then there was also stoning was one of the ways to take care of somebody that committed adultery. So penalty there was death. <clears throat> I don't know if there's enough stones left in the world to deal with adultery, do you? <laughs> Probably not. But God was gracious to David. Nathan said, God is not going to kill you. He's going to let you live. And sin itself can grieve us. But then when God forgives somebody in grace, as he did with David, the consequences of those sins may still surface. Did you know that if you committed sins before you trusted Christ as Savior, those sins are forgiven. You're never going to be held accountable for them. But the consequences may still spring up. Absalom, you remember, rebelled and committed sexual sins in the public eyesight of all Israel to embarrass his father. David's first child with Bathsheba died, but God's grace and mercy were comforts to David. And you and I need not make this mistake. Never underestimate the power of God's grace to comfort us in the most painful of our griefs. Everything we face which causes us grief, none of it is greater than the enabling power of God's grace. When he knew that he was facing a life of disease, the Apostle Paul wanted his cause of grief, the disease, to be removed, and he asked God to do so. He said three times. God said to him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And we know that he handled the grief correctly because a short few lines later, he says, most gladly, therefore, will I therefore rejoice. Grief is often painful. Grief is often frustrating. Grief creates sorrow. Grief makes us bitter. Grief distresses us. Grief puts us through mental anguish. But that can be good. And here's why. Because grief reminds us of our human limitations. And if we are not reminded of our human limitations, we'll be wanting to tell God that we're in control. Secondly, grief reminds us of life's uncertainties. It's unrealistic to think that you're going to live any length of time and everything's going to be exactly the way you want it. It's really unrealistic. Thirdly, grief reminds us of what we need to correct in our lives. One of the greatest causes of grief is a sinful pattern in our lives. And we need to be looking for that. Pray with David, search me, O God, and know my ways. And then number four, grief reminds us of our need for God's comforting grace. 
in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul referred to him as the God of all comfort. And he wants to comfort us. He wants to use his unlimited resource of grace to reinforce us even in the griefs that he allows into our lives. Job struggled with all that God allowed into his life because he knew he hadn't done anything wrong. And later he got God's approval for the way he handled all of the grief that he experienced. Think of that. You've read the book of Job. You know the grievous things that happened to him. But we're told that at the end, God blessed him more abundantly than he'd ever been blessed before. Let's stand together for prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we love you. We thank you for your guidance in our lives. And Lord, grief is something that we all face and can be caused for a lot by a lot of things. In most cases, the grief is known ahead of time by you and is allowed into our lives. And we can turn that grief into something good by following the scriptural principles you've laid out for us. So we ask you to speak to our hearts now as we open the altar in Jesus' name. Amen. What page?